Hi everyone, we're talking about a condition known as Meckel diverticulum in this lesson. So Meckel diverticulum is actually the most common congenital anomaly of the gastrointestinal tract, meaning that it is something that a patient is born with. It is congenital and it is an anomaly of the gastrointestinal tract, more specifically the small intestine. It is considered a true diverticulum, meaning that it has all three layers of the small intestine. So it has the mucosa, submucosa, and muscularis propria. And it often contains abnormal tissue as well. So it often will contain gastric mucosa where it shouldn't be. And this can lead to a variety of signs and symptoms we're going to talk about later on in this lesson. Now this Meckel diverticulum is actually considered a vestigial remnant of the vitiline or vitilo intestinal duct, which is also known as the umphalo mesenteric duct. So this duct is present during embryonic development, but it's supposed to regress. It's supposed to go away. This duct was actually a connection between the yolk sac and the primitive gut early on in embryonic development. It's supposed to regress around five to seven weeks in utero, but in the condition of Meckel diverticulum, there is this failure of regression of this duct. And again, this will lead to this anomaly of a Meckel diverticulum. So it's the failure of a vitiline duct to regress at around five to seven weeks in utero. Now let's talk about the epidemiology in some anatomy with regards to where a Meckel diverticulum occurs. And the information in this slide is going to be remembered by the mnemonic rule of twos. So rule of twos, we're going to see many twos in the next several sentences of information. So Meckel diverticulum is estimated to occur in roughly 2% of the population. It often has a two to three to one male to female ratio. This may be more specifically in presented cases. So in the cases where males are more likely to be symptomatic, this may be the reason why we see this ratio occurring. Symptomatic cases occur in two to four percent of all cases. And a Meckel diverticulum often presents by the age of two. So it's going to be a pediatric condition. So how the next set of information is going to apply to this rule of twos is more going to be applicable in imperial measurement countries compared to metric countries. So it's going to be more likely to be seen in the US, but I will also show the metric measurements as well. So the Meckel diverticulum itself is often found within two feet of the ileocecal valve. And in metric measurements, this is going to be 60 centimeters. And the range is oftentimes going to be 45 to 90 centimeters. The Meckel diverticulum is most often going to be around two inches in length. So that's about five centimeters. It can range anywhere from one to 12 centimeters. And the longer it gets, the more problematic it becomes. The diameter of the Meckel diverticulum is oftentimes going to be two inches. So again, this is going to be about five centimeters in diameter. And there are going to be two types of tissue. So these two types of tissue are going to be gastric and pancreatic. So they're going to be ectopic gastric and pancreatic tissue within the Meckel diverticulum. So these are the rule of twos. And this is why we use this as a particular mnemonic because it can help us remember some of the epidemiology and some of the anatomical facts with a Meckel diverticulum. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of a Meckel diverticulum. We should note that oftentimes a patient will be asymptomatic in adulthood. So if you're an adult with a Meckel diverticulum, you're oftentimes not going to have any symptoms at all. In the cases where there are symptoms, the risk factors for actually having symptoms include a younger age patient, so oftentimes it's going to be a younger child, being male, having a longer diverticulum. So the longer the diverticulum becomes, the more likely a patient will have signs and symptoms and the presence of histologically abnormal tissue. So if there is more ectopic gastric mucosa tissue, for instance, that's going to increase the risk for having signs and symptoms. So let's talk about some of those signs and symptoms. So some of them are going to be signs and symptoms of the Meckel diverticulum, and some of them are going to be complications from the Meckel diverticulum. So by far the most common finding in a Meckel diverticulum is going to be hemorrhage. That tissue in the Meckel diverticulum is going to bleed, can oftentimes be an ulceration of the tissue. Again, this is going to be the most common finding due to the mucosa of the Meckel diverticulum being ulcerated, as we mentioned before, and it presents with particular signs and symptoms. Blight red blood per rectum or hematochesia would be the other term for this. We can see bloody stool or we can see blood streaked stool. Molina stool, so this is going to be a black, tarry, and smelly stool. Current jelly stools can also 
be something that's noted as well. And because of all of this bleeding, there can be anemia. So there can be signs and symptoms of an iron deficiency anemia as well. And in children, it's going to present as painless lower gastrointestinal bleeding. So because this is oftentimes going to be a pediatric condition, the patient is going to be a younger child with painless bright red blood parectum, and this could be a finding that this is echo diverticulum. Patients can also experience tenderness or pain. So tenderness is going to occur to palpation. So if it's actually pushed on in the area, especially around the lower abdomen near the embolicus or near the belly button, that's going to be the area where it's tender. Patient may also have abdominal pain without having their abdomen palpated as well. And then one of the complications of having a mechal diverticulum is a possible small bowel obstruction. So you can imagine that if you've got that mechal diverticulum hanging off of the small intestine, things can get twisted and wrapped around causing an obstruction. More specifically, we can see if there is a fibrotic band connecting the mechal diverticulum to the abdominal wall, this can cause a valvulus to occur. And then because of the small bowel obstruction, we can see signs and symptoms of a small bowel obstruction, including abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and obstipation, meaning that there is no passing of stool or passing of flatus. So those can also be signs of a small bowel obstruction and a possible mechal diverticulum. Some other complications of having a mechal diverticulum is the possibility of having mechal's diverticulitis. So diverticulitis, itis, meaning inflammation. So it's inflammation of the mechal diverticulum. This is more likely to occur in elderly patients. So this is going to be a more specific finding for older patients as opposed to younger patients. So if an older patient still has their mechal diverticulum, if it hasn't been surgically removed, they are at a risk for having mechal's diverticulitis. And some signs and symptoms of Meckel's diverticulitis include having intermittent crampy abdominal pain. With regards to the Meckel diverticulitis, it can lead to perforation. So because of all the inflammation within the diverticulum itself, this outpouching off of the small intestine, there can be expansion and edema and more inflammation of the diverticulum leading to a perforation or a breakage of the wall leading to or increasing the risk for peritonitis or an infection within the peritoneum. And some other umbilical anomalies that can occur with a mechal diverticulum include an omphalomesenteric fistula that can occur. So a fistula can connect between the mechal diverticulum and the outside or the outside of the abdominal wall. An umbilical sinus can also occur. An umbilical cyst may also occur. And then a fibrous band can also be connected to the abdominal wall and the mechal diverticulum as well. And in some patients with a mechal diverticulum, they may have a neoplasm, a leiomyoma. So this is also something that can occur with some patients as well. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose a mechal diverticulum. If it is an asymptomatic mechal diverticulum, it can be difficult to detect. And oftentimes it's going to be an incidental finding, meaning that it's found when doing some other procedure. So it's just something that is noted in a patient. And this can oftentimes occur with laparotomy or laparoscopy. And an asymptomatic mechal diverticulum can be detected on an abdominal x-ray or an upper GI series with small bowel follow-through. In the cases where it is symptomatic with those symptoms we talked about before, it can be detected with a technetium 99M pertechnetate scanning. So this is considered the mechal scan. So in this scan, we can detect gastric mucosa. So we can see it in the stomach, but we can also see it in the mechal diverticulum itself. So that is a way to detect a mechal diverticulum. And the way that this scan works is that the isotope is taken up by ectopic gastric mucosa. And another way symptomatic mechal diverticulum can be detected and diagnosed is through angiography with superior mesenteric angiography. And then some other ways include CT scan and double balloon enteroscopy. How do clinicians treat this condition? We alluded to this before, but a mechal diverticulum, if it is causing issues, is going to be treated with surgical resection, so surgical removal of the diverticulum. There are going to be particular indications for surgery, and these are going to include hemorrhage if it is inflamed, so if it is a Meckel's diverticulitis, if it has caused obstruction, if it is causing a fistula, and in certain incidental cases, if the patient has a laparotomy or laparoscopic surgery for some other reason, and it is noted that there is a fibrous 
band or some other chance that the mechal diverticulum can cause obstruction and issues later on in the future. That may also be an indication for surgical resection as well. And there are particular types of surgery that may occur. These include a diverticulectomy, so actually removing the mechal diverticulum. Another type of surgery would be just to remove the fibrous band. So a surgeon can remove the fibrous band and also remove the diverticulum. So that would be a diverticulectomy, or they may not. They may just remove the fibrous band. And in some cases, a surgeon may remove that entire section of the small intestine. So they might remove the diverticulum with the connected area of the small intestine and then do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. So connecting the two parts of the small intestine back together. So that is also another potential surgery a surgeon may employ with a mechal diverticulum. So if you want to learn more about other pediatric and gastrointestinal conditions, please check out my playlists on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.